Hello, my name's James Titcombe. I work for CQC as an advisor in patient safety, and I'm here today to talk to CQC's three chief inspectors. A lot of the people wrote in um, about patients, their, their relatives with dementia, and concerned that, you know, whether they were getting the appropriate care for their individual needs. Um, and so the question really is, do you think the system at the moment does cater for people's individual needs well enough? And is there anything we can do to, to improve that? Do I think it <coughs> caters well enough? The answer is almost certainly no. Do I think that there are some places that are doing it very well? Probably yes. Uh, so again, it's a question of going into different hospitals, looking particularly in this case for dementia at the wards uh, for frail elderly, but also looking at how they're cared for in the accident and emergency department, um, and really looking to see what is going on there. And what I hope we'll be able to do is to share good practice across the country. We will see hospitals where this is being done very well, we already have, mm. um, and then we will be able to push reports out saying this is good practice and I hope that others will then learn from that. Okay. And if I can just add, I mean, I think that this is where working across all of our three areas is really important mm. because people mm. with dementia actually will pitch up in any of the services that we're mm. regulating. And mm. it's also where we can learn from each other's good practice. Mm. So there's some fantastic examples of really good um, care for people with dementia, focusing mm. on a person-centred approach um, that happens in adult social care. And I'm sure that Mike and Steve would, would both want to be able to use that that experience to inform Absolutely. the questions that they're asking mm. as well. And the way CQC is going to work in the future is in a much more integrated way mm. across the three particular areas. So for example, dementia, patients with dementia often present in general practice but their referrals we know are, are delayed, um, which causes problems with the patients and the relatives not knowing what's going mm. on not having time to look ahead and coordinate services in mm. future, but we'll be doing um, many more uh, themed, um, integrated um, looks at services. So we're going to go in every six months to each CCG in the country. And not only will we be looking at GP practices, but we'll be looking across, for example, in social care, how do um, care homes and GPs coordinate yeah. medicines management? because we know that poor medicines management, whether it's prescribing or, mm. or giving them to the patients or not, mm. uh, leads to more hospital admissions and mm. poorer care. We had a question from Julia Mansbridge and she says, would you accept that one of the main reasons why there's an increased pressure on A&E departments is because of the failure of the GP out-of-hours service? Well, we know that in some areas the out-of-hours service works very well. It, it, mm. uh, as Mike said about the issues on different wards in different areas, um, causes of uh, problems with A&E can be very, very different and it might be a mixture of social care, a uh, mixture of um, how the hospital works in itself, whether the, the wards, uh, the doctors on the wards are getting people back on their feet and out into social care. It might be that uh, GP's hours uh, are not working for the patient um, mm. and we know that Friday nights um, and over the weekend it, it's difficult so I, I think it would be harsh to say it's just about out of hours mm. but I think the principle of joining everything up mm. is where we need to move. Because we had some other comments as well I mean Georgina um, asked um, what can we do to, to encourage GPs to offer more appointments at the times when, when people need them? Well, I think it's a really good question. I'm, I'm a GP and our practice um, feel as though they're drowning under the workload at the moment. Mm -hmm. It comes back to the patient. Uh, how do we help and encourage patients to look after themselves and, need, and to know what service to use when uh, and, and how to do that? So mm -hmm. it's not all about give, give us more money, give us more uh, people. It's how you work. And um, there are a number of surgeries around the country where um, the GPs do the triage, the, the, the sifting on the phone. Mm. They speak to every patient who contacts the surgery. The patient satisfaction uh, is good. And also they need fewer GPs. So GPs need to be reserved for the really complex diagnostic work. We know that nurses and pharmacists and others 
um, provide uh, just as good, if not better, long-term condition care. So we need a transformation in how care is provided. Mm. One of the themes in the various reports that have come out in recent years is families and carers and, and patients not being listened to. I can probably vouch for that myself. Um, and we've had lots of questions around this. Um, so um, could I ask you, Andrea, um, to what extent is the CQC going to really look carefully at patient feedback and complaints when we're doing our inspections in the future to make sure we, we close that gap? Well, we've been absolutely clear um, from the publication of the strategy earlier this year and through everything that Mike has done and that I've done, I know that Steve is working on now, um, that the Care Quality Commission will be on the side of people who are using services. And one absolutely critical way of demonstrating that is to listen um, to people who are using services, um, what their experience has been, what they've liked, um, and they want to make sure that we continue to do, um, and where they have had concerns um, to make sure that we're building that into the questions that we ask um, in our inspections to build that into the intelligence and the insight that we gain um, about individual services and also to make sure that we're feeding back to people so that they know what we've done with that information um, and they can readily access it. It's a treasure trove really mm -hmm. for us to, to learn in a number of different ways. First of all if we look at the complaints from in a hospital before we go to do an inspection that can help direct us to which area it may be. Is it the outpatient department? Is it the ophthalmology department? Is it always the question of car parking? All the other areas. So it, it, that can actually direct our inspection. The other side of it is how well does the trust handle those complaints? And I'm not just talking about how quickly they get a response back, but do they really try and learn from that? And one of the questions that we're beginning to ask is, and what change have you ever made as a result of a complaint and the learning from it? And we're beginning to hear one or two places that really are saying, yes, they have made significant changes based on complaints. And I think that's what I'd like to see more of in the, in the coming months. We also need to remember that um, complaints and suggestions are, uh, are, are similar sometimes. Um, mm. Patients have great ideas about how the service could be improved and we don't ask them in that way. The patients understand these things, mm -hmm. they understand where the, where the problems are, mm -hmm. and, and, and asking for advice and suggestions rather than just for complaints might be a, mm -hmm. a, a very positive way of engaging better with the patients. Okay. Um, it's a really good idea because we also know that certainly in adult social care um, people are very reluctant to mm. complain um, but if we were asking them in the positive way that you just mm. suggested which I know um, some places do much more likely to get um, a constructive um, uh, uh, input to the way that services can improve. Okay well thank you very much for answering our uh, viewers questions and um, thank you very much for watching.